Praise the Lord. Praise Greetings to each one of you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Such a joy it is to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Come together here with one heart and one mind before the Lord. Also spending time with one another, uh, worshiping the Lord with one heart and one mind. Hallelujah. Amen. What a blessing it is. Let us, uh, uh, well, before we turn there, um, uh, starting last week, we began a new sermon series um, that will carry us for the few months called The New and Living Way. Last week, uh, Minu laid a foundation. I will continue to lay that foundation here this, uh, today as well. But Minu described the uh, natural state of man as being in a depraved state. In Jeremiah, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In Isaiah, it says, Our righteous acts are like filthy rags. And Minu reminded us that God enacted his rescue plan made in eternity past to send his son to become the savior of mankind, to break us out of this state of depravity. The son of God took upon human flesh. He fulfilled the demands of the law perfectly to become the innocent, spotless lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. So Menu last week was able to cover a little bit of these things in depth, but I'm just giving you a summary as to what he mentioned last week. And uh, this is the foundation and the context at which we're going to build this series in the coming weeks and months. So today, what we will do, uh, I will briefly introduce the rest of the series and then cover the specific topic that is assigned to me. Um, and so as we flip through the pages of Scripture, we find God either renewing mankind or He promises re renewal. This is a common theme through Scripture from the beginning to the end, starting with the creation to the flood narrative and, and Noah to Exodus, the establishment of the kingdom of Israel, and, and uh, the multiple promises of the Messiah, the arrival of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the expansion of the church, and in the future we are awaiting the second coming of Christ, his reign and renewal of all creation in the heavens, new heavens and the new earth. We're seeing this theme of being renewed and being new occurring over and over. In the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 5, we read, uh, and this is John uh, recounting to us, And he who was seated on the throne, Jesus, said, Behold, I am making all things new. And also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So while Jesus has his ultimate plan of renewal in the end of age, as we are seated here, Jesus is engaging with each one of us in his renewal effort in and through us. And he wants us to see us transformed uh, and renewed at a personal level, at a family level, at a church level, and, and ultimately carry out, we, he wants us to carry out his purpose of renewal to the ends of the earth until he comes, when he will once and for all perfectly renew the heavens and the earth. And this glorious truth is what leads us to our key text for the series, which is there uh, uh, on the which on the front, uh, the first slide, Hebrews chapter 10, 19, now read through 25. Hebrews chapter 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter in the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean up from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of, of our hope without wavering, for he, promised, he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Amen. Hallelujah. So here's the, what the author is saying. Through the torn body and the shed blood of our great high priest and mediator, Jesus Christ, we have confidence to enter in this new and living way, completely cleansed and resting in the faithfulness of God, not just by ourselves, 
but with, along with fellow brothers and sisters, encouraging us along as we together await the second coming of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So in the next slide, we have the breakdown of the sermon series. So God willing, uh, it's the one before that. God willing, as we break down this theme of the new and living way, uh, we will uh, center our focus around the seven themes, as you see on the slide. First is the new covenant, and second, new birth, a new heart, new fruit, new family, new purpose, and new heavens and, and the new earth. And our desire is to break down these sub-themes even further and cover all aspects as the Spirit leads us. And there will be messages, uh, you know, these will be messages centered around theology, Christology, you know, practical application, and even the study of end times, eschatology. We, uh, we'll see how the Lord leads us uh, in the coming few months. So as you see, the top of that list is New Covenant. That's what I, I wish to cover in the time that I have ahead of me. And, and the challenge... I have today is to keep this as brief as possible, to make it as easy as uh, easy to understand as possible, to make it as practical as possible, edifying as possible, and so basically it's an impossible task uh, to meet. Uh, so uh, I want us uh, let us pray together before uh, we dig in. Heavenly Father, we uh, give you all the praise, glory, honor for this morning, for this is the day that you have made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it, God. God, as we uh, cover, O oh Lord, this precious topic of the new covenant, O oh Lord. Help us to be our minds to be enlightened by the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would use me, O oh Lord God, to speak only the things that, that that your people need to hear, and help me to process everything, to speak everything, O oh Lord, with uh, with the confidence, O oh Lord, and also with the unction of the Holy Spirit. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor, O oh Lord God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 When we say the word new covenant or the phrase new covenant, some questions should pop up in our mind. You know, if there's a new covenant, that is inferring to the fact that there's an old covenant, right? And, if the, and what is the need of having a new covenant if God established the old covenant? And by the way, what is covenant? What does that word even mean? And of course, after we know all these answers. What does this mean for me today? And God willing, if, and if time allows, I, I hope to answer these questions through uh, what I have prepared this morning. And so in the next slide, uh, here's the definition of covenant. A covenant is a chosen relationship or a partnership in which two parties make binding promises to each other and work together to reach a common goal. And the most common type of covenant that we see day in and day out is what? Is the covenant of? Marriage. marriage. Covenant of marriage. Isn't that a, the, in the wisdom of God to put something as real as that in our life just to remind us of the value of a covenant relationship? Where as we, as those who are married, work out this marriage covenant, it reminds us of the faithful covenant of Christ with His church and hallelujah. And so, and from the beginning of time, we see man, God dealing with mankind in terms of covenants. And, and there, are, uh, there are many ways to interpret this, but there are my majorly five, five major covenants in redemption story. In the next slide, uh, I'll cover each of these covenants one by one. The Noahic co covenant, the, uh, the, by each name you will know who the person associated with, of course. So in the, in, the, in the covenant for Noah and his family, we see that in Genesis 6, 8, and 9, after the flood subsided and, and Noah's family got out of the ark, we know that Noah built, a, built an altar, and he offered a burnt offering of clean animals. And we see that there was a pleasing aroma to the, to the Lord. And upon that, Noah gave them a covenant. The covenant that God gave at, at that point was that he told Noah and his family that he will never intervene in the manner that he did during the flood to, to destroy mankind in such a way. And, and, and as a sign, he gave the rainbow as a sign. And this was a global covenant. This, this applied to believers and unbelievers alike. And we'll see how that will come full circle as we get to the end. Second covenant is the Abrahamic covenant. And we see this 
God relating with Abraham in, the, in terms of a covenant in Genesis 12, 15, 17, and then also 22. It is generally believed that, that, Abraham, uh, that God had two covenants with Abraham. The first covenant was, to, was promised to make Abraham the great nation. And the second covenant was that through him and his offspring, all the families of the earth, all the nations will be blessed. And the sign of this covenant was the circumcision. And we also see that, that God, you know, Abraham brings an offering and God walks in the middle of the, the, the offering to ratify this covenant. And the second sacrificial offering we see is in Genesis 15 when God, uh, or Genesis 22, when, when Abraham offers Isaac as a, as a sacrifice. And that's when Abraham, uh, God uh, promises or makes the, the covenant made known again. Third is the Mosaic covenant. And we see that described in, the, in, in Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. God establishes the Levitical, uh, the sacrificial system and all the rituals that we study and that we know. And God's promise here is that he will make Israel a, 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 a special nation. He will be a special people. That he will make this nation a blessing so that other nations can know who the true God is. Fourth is the Davidic covenant. The Israel, people of Israel desired for a king. Well, God established a king to, to, uh, according to their wishes. But when David came into power after Saul, God promised to make his name great. He promises to that that you know to that the kingdom of David would would and his offering's offspring will last forever. In the new covenant, and I'm going through this fairly quickly because of the lack of time. Through all the covenants we covered, we're seeing a gradual buildup to this final covenant. God is preserving mankind through the covenant of Noah. God promises an offspring who will be a blessing to the nations in Abraham. God preserves Israel and forms an everlasting bond with the people of Israel. God establishes a king and promises that the offspring of David will have an everlasting kingdom. And through this, these, each of these covenants being established, we're getting a clear picture of God's ultimate plan through Jesus Christ. The thing about the covenants before the new covenant is that no one was able to keep their end of the conditions laid out by the covenant. And so this failure of keeping the covenants led Israel through deep trials and, and, and judgment. The temples in which offerings were made were destroyed. The people of Israel were scattered and they were exiled to Babylon. And in the midst of the failures by the kings, leaders, and the people, God begins to lay out his new covenant to the prophets. He sheds a glimmer of hope even in that darkness in those, in those very testing times. And so I want to highlight a, a, a passage of scripture in Jeremiah chapter 31, 31 and 34, God mentions about a new covenant. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not, not, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in, in their minds and write it on their hearts. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. They will no longer teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Amen. Hallelujah. There's a, a, another passage in which... This term, the new covenant, is mentioned. And Jesus is the one who brings it up next. And we know this, and uh, we say this every time we, uh, we do our Lord's table. And in particular, I will highlight Luke chapter 22, 19 to 20. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after he had Eat, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to highlight some verses in Hebrews because a lot of this is covered in depth in Hebrews. And just one reading through uh, the epistle of Hebrews actually 
uh, would be the best thing because this is a sermon in of itself. Hebrews is a, it's a sermon. Uh, but, you know, as a, as a spirit leads, I will, I will highlight some things um, uh, that comparing the, the old Levitical priesthood and, and, the, and, the, and the high priest, the permanent priesthood established by Christ. And, and Hebrews chapter 7 We'll, I'll be skipping through a lot, so if, if, you, uh, if you were to kind of go with me, it would be easier. Hebrews chapter 7, um, we'll go, verse 11. If perfection had been attainable to the Levitical priesthood, under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? So the Levitical priesthood is named after the order of Aaron. You know, Aaron and his descendants, uh, uh, of course, were from the tribe of Levi. Uh, and, and so here the author is asking, why is there a need for another, uh, the, the reason why there is, a, there is a need for another order under the order of Melchizedek rather than the order of Aaron because perfection was not, was not able to be attained in the Levitical priesthood, because the high priests themselves were sinful. So Melchizedek, which mystery character we all know, the, the, the chapter begins with a description of who Melchizedek is, the king of Salem, the king of righteousness. He has, without, verse 3 of chapter 7, he is without father and mother of genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. It seems as though that Melchizedek is a totally different person. Again, I'm not an expert in this. But here, Jesus Christ is taking, is following this order of Melchizedek, who was the high priest that Abraham Abraham dealt with in his time, offered, uh, offered tithes to Melchizedek, and he remains a permanent priesthood, and Jesus Christ aligns with him with that priesthood instead of the order of Aaron, which was maligned by sin. In, in verse 16 of chapter 7, it says that the, the Levitical priesthood was on the basis of a legal requirement con concerning bodily descent. In a sense, only the sons of Aaron and the, their grandsons and all on, on and on could be part of this priesthood. But in, in the case of Christ, it's the power of indestructible life. The, the fact that Christ is, was raised from the dead, he has always been alive, he's permanently seated as the high priest forever, makes him in line with the order of Melchizedek. In verse 18, it talks about the weakness and the uselessness of the, the former covenant and that through the through the new covenant there's hope as we draw near to God verse 22 says Jesus is the guarantor of the guarantor of the better covenant that there's hope because we have a, a living a, a, a living high priest in the heavens and verse 23 says that the former priests were they were prevented by death from continuing office there were many priests but in the case of Jesus, verse 24, he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. And he always lives to make intercession for them. Just a reminder, but do we realize that Christ is making intercession for us? Verse 26, so it, it was fitting, indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for, for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, since he did this once and for all when he offered up himself. In chapter 8, it, it summarizes everything. It brings it. Now the point in what we're saying is this. So everything that has been said before that comes down to this, that we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord has set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also something to offer. He goes on to say, 
that the, the priests that were under the Levitical order were doing things as it was only a copy, a shadow of the heavenly things. So what, which priesthood is, is more, which priesthood makes a, a, a more lasting, uh, lasting uh, value? It is the priesthood in heaven, not on earth. The, the one on earth is temporal. Verse, eight it says, or verse 7 it says, For that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. So the first covenant had some faults in there. It's not the law. The law is perfect. The law is good. The law is a, a mirror. The law is a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. It's not the law itself. It is a system. It's a system that had been carried out by the sinful, the sinful priesthood. That was just impossible to have a covenant managed and carried out by human beings, uh, sinful human beings. Now, uh, verse 8 onwards, it, 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 it talks about that same verse that I, I read from uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, 34. And then skipped in verse 13. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and, that, and what is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to vanish away. In other words, when we say something is obsolete, we think it's done and over with, we can ignore it. That's not what the author is saying. The author is saying that is, while we are in this world, while we, are, while, while we are struggling with our own flesh, we still need this law. We still need the law to show us what is right and wrong. The law cannot change our hearts. The law cannot cleanse our, our guilty conscience. But the law can show us whether or not, and, and, and Jeremiah says that, you know, that I will put my laws in their hearts. I will, you know, I'll write them on their hearts. So the law helps us to look at our own hearts and say, is that true? Is that true? Or am I, am I still way off? Is it, so this is a progressional, it's a, it's a, it's a process, uh, progressional sanctification where our, our sinful, our hearts are being reformed daily. That, that, that these laws are being written in our hearts daily. We don't magically receive a heart that is, completely written with the, lo the law of God in our hearts. There are, it is there by the Spirit, but then we are working with our flesh daily, and we need the law of God as a mirror to, show, to tell us, because you know, there are false believers that would say, well, I believe in Jesus. The law is done with. I, I can live however I want, right? And so the law still exists. The law still is needed, and it, but it is ready to vanish away. It, it, when, when Christ returns, when we receive a glorious body, once and for all, the, 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 the letter of the law, the, the things that we need to help us to, to know whether we're doing right or wrong will be done away with for good and will be fully realized as people with the law of God written in our hearts, you know, uh, uh, with, a, with a clean conscience and a, and, and a clean body, clean heart, everything. Now, as we move forward, it says here that uh, in, in verse 9, Six onwards again. This making the comparison between the 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 heaven and the earth, and in the first verses of chapter nine, it talks about a tent and the, the heavenly tent and all the uh, all the things the, the holy place, most holy place, and all of that. In verse six, it says, "These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, which is the holy place, performing their ritual duties. But into the second only, the high priest goes, but only once a year." not taking without the blood which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. Verse 8 of chapter 9, According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are, off, are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but only deal, only deal with food and drink and various washings, regulations of the body imposed until the time of reformation. And we'll see how that circles back when I get to, the, get to verse uh, 15. Let's keep on reading. But then when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, this is the tent that is made with, not with human hands. This is a tent in heavenly places. It's not even of his creation. Again, these are all mysteries. When Jesus now, verse 12, he entered once and for all to the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but, but by his own blood, securing eternal redemption. 
Verse 13, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer uh, sanctified for the purification of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ through who the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God purify our conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? So you have this old Levitical system that Gifts and sacrifice were offered, but it did nothing to perfect the conscience. It did nothing to purify the conscience. But the sacrifice that Jesus offers once and for all by the eternal spirit can purify our conscience. Verse 15, therefore he is now the mediator of a new covenant. This is, uh, this is what I wanted to get to. So that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them. From the transgressions committed under the first covenant. The transgressions that the first covenant could not cover, Jesus covered with his death on the cross. And he promises not just the just earthly cleansing, but he promises eternal inheritance. Once and for all, declared righteous before God. We, we talked about that when we talked about justification. When we go, uh, skip on to... And I, I, I'm wrapping up here. You guys can be patient one second. <laughs> uh, chapter 10, verse 11 onwards. And every priest stands daily at his service. And this is talking about the, the high priest, the, the, the human high priest. Every high priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which he can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins... He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until the enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And that leads to what we read when we began this, uh, this message, which is our key verse from, uh, for this series. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter in the holy places by the blood of Jesus, through a new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest, high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Jesus can cleanse our evil conscience clean, and our bodies washed with pure water, with the word of God. So what, is, what do we see here in this new covenant that God establishes? He's the fulfillment of the old covenant. He's the author of this new salva this salvation. He's a mediator of the new covenant. He's a guarantor of the new covenant. And while every other covenantal community that God gave his covenants broke their covenant with God, Jesus remained faithful and obedient. So in light of all these things, in light of this precious truth that we have that we are now by faith entering into this new covenant with Christ. What should we do? What should we do? Three things. And I have that on the slide. Next slide. One, we should rest in the finished work of Christ. Jesus made that invitation that come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus gives us rest from this weary and broken world of, of trying to prove ourselves, of, of uh, works after works, of trying to attain uh, this impossible standard. He gives us rest, and we can rest in his work, the finished work he done. When he said, it is finished, it was truly finished. And, one, and then he went into the heavenly places with his blood, and once and for all applied, he offered up a sacrifice once and for all. He is the true, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the true Sabbath. We can rest in Jesus. Number two, we can trust in the faithfulness of Christ. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. There is no other guarantee like the guarantee of Christ. Many other people might leave you and forsake you in your life. Many people may have left you and forsaken you. But Christ is promising to us through his torn flesh, through his shed blood, Amen. that I will never leave you nor forsake sake you. If I would have, I would have at the cross, but I did not. For the joy set before me, I endure the cross, scorning his shame. 
And now I am seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? We know that precious passage from Romans chapter 8. Life nor death, no angels, no, no rulers or principalities or things to come. Things now. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Number three, and I invite the worship team to come forward. We can draw near with confidence to the throne of Jesus. What we lack sometimes as Christians is confidence and boldness. We're always pulling back. Like we're always thinking about, oh, I, you know, does, does Jesus know me? Does Jesus like me? I don't even like myself. My parents don't like me. My relatives don't like me. We, we have this identity crisis every time we try to approach Christ in prayer or, or in worship or even in a congregation like this. You might be asking yourself, you might be questioning your own confidence in Christ. And here's an invitation. Romans 4, 15 and 16. Let me just read that as we go into time of worship. We all know this really well, but in light of everything that we, we talked about, hope this sheds more light. Romans 4, 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He has been tempted as we are in every way, yet without sin. In one hand, he understands the weight of our sin. He understands it even more than us because he, he was victorious. We give up when we get a little bit of temptation. We don't know the full depth of that temptation because we, we tap out early. But Jesus endured the full weight of that temptation, yet was victorious. So he understands, he understands what it means to be human. And the fact that he is sinless, it gives us hope that through him, we can finally attain the righteous decree and the righteous requirement laid out by the Father that to be holy as I am holy. And God, does not, God didn't just leave us on the sideway and saying, figure it out by yourself. That's not what God did. God sent His son, only begotten Son because He loved us so much. He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the righteous decrees. He lived a life that we, that like us, yet without sin. But He became that perfect sacrifice to die in our place. He understands more than anybody else, more than even me, I'm telling you, more than the pastor of this church, more than any person, the best person in this church. He still, he understands you even better. And I want to point you to that Christ. Verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Just think about the fact that we draw with confidence to the throne of grace. Just imagine this oceans of grace washing over us as we draw near with confidence to Him. We're coming in brokenhearted. We're coming in needy. Lord, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of my unrighteousness. And He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And you, when you approach that throne of grace, you experience the oceans of mercy and grace over your life. And it says that we, so we, can, we should approach with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace in help in our time of need. I don't know about you, but every moment is a time of need while we are in this earth. Every moment is. If you don't know that you're in a time of need, actually that is a sign that you are in a time of need because you are being blinded by something. So as we rise up in the presence of God this morning, hallelujah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace with confidence, with boldness, seeking the throne of grace, O Lord. Cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness, O oh God, by the precious blood of the Lamb. But it was applied once and for all. And now you're seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us daily. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for your love, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And we pray, O oh God, as we sing songs, as we lay down our lives, as we hear from your word, as we got gathered together here this morning, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will have your way. Help us to see the beauty of Christ, high and exalted, and help us to endure to the end 
so that we may see him face to face. We give you all the praise, glory, honor, O God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.